Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another We Can workshop. My name is Carrie Ramsey, and I'm the project manager for the We Can project, which stands for Women Entrepreneurs Can, and it is led by Queen's University. We are so grateful that you're here today joining us for Boost Your Business with podcasting with Amy Lynch uh, from the Ottawa area. Amy, thanks so much for joining us today. And to every single one of you, whether this is your first We Can workshop or you have been here dozens and dozens and dozens of times. It's so great to have you here. And speaking of which, thanks to Barbara, who's already made a little note in the Zoom chat. That's what I'm looking for you guys to do right now. If you don't mind, why don't you just say hi to each other? Let us know where you're connecting from. Why don't you let us know what your business is? Even if you've done it many times before, there are always new faces in the room. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to do that in a networking sense right now, just to reach out to others who are in the group. And while you do, I'll take a moment to acknowledge that I'm connecting to this workshop from the Bay of Quinte region, which is the ancestral territory of the Huron, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And one thing I wanted to highlight today was that two weeks from today, on September 30th, it is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So traditionally, this has also been known as Orange Shirt Day, and it has been a chance to commemorate and remember the children and the families affected by the residential school system here in Canada. So if you haven't already, I wanted to flag that it's two weeks away, at least at the time of this recording, so that if you don't have your orange shirt, you can maybe uh, find one, you can plan to be a part of um, which, what is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, also known as Orange Shirt Day. So you will certainly see me with mine on that day, and uh, I hope that you will participate as well, since it's such a very important day to mark. So Welcome everyone to the workshop. I am excited and I hope you are as well to dive into this topic. I was saying earlier before we hit record that I'm just so excited and encouraged by the number of women who are starting podcasts. And the reason for that is I truly believe that if we're going to see some changes in our world, we need to hear more women's voices. And so, Amy, I'm so excited to have you here today. I know you're going to give a little bit about your background as well. So I'm going to hand you the virtual microphone right now. Welcome to the workshop, and thank you so much for agreeing to lead it for us today. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon. I see someone just joining from Belgium, so maybe it's close to noon there. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And if you registered for the July session, I apologize that I couldn't deliver it then. I was really Looking forward to it, but I'm so glad that you could join me today. So better late than never, and you can get started on your podcast, hopefully before the end of the year, if you haven't been planning it already, if you decide that this session sparks some interest in you. So I am going to, I think I have to scroll, unfortunately, Carrie, with this because I'm in a different view mode. So I'll see, I don't know if I can just do full screen, maybe with the thumbnails again. Because I know that might bother. Sure, whatever works for you. Okay, so I'll do full screen. It just means that I might not see the chat. So I might get Carrie to call out some of the answers because some of the session is interactive and I really want your feedback. So a bit about me. I am a mom. I have two kids, five and three, and I'm due to have another one in January. I am a writer. I... I'm a founder, I am a freelancer, I've been remote working since 2014 across time zones, and I became an activist, accidental activist in 2016 when I gave birth to our first son. We were living overseas because as a freelancer, I was used to going to all these networking events by myself, and I kept going, and I brought him with me, and apparently that was a bit weird. So I was accepted. I was very fortunate to get accepted into a startup program, which was designed for parents. I saw how things could be different. And I decided to start creating those kind of things here whenever I moved back to Canada uh, a year later. So that became mixing babies and business. That was uh, based on my experience in the startup program. And I, I just like to share this slide because I wanna show people that I've been using the same tools. It's kind of embarrassing. I still have the same, I've got my laptop here, same one that I used to use in Europe. So if, if you're worried about costs or you know having the right gear, 
I am proof that you can just keep using the same old stuff and it'll be okay. But I do, I do have a newer iMac computer from a couple years ago, but I like to do things that are portable. You can do with one hand, as you can see, I'm feeding in the one photo that was totally just for the photo. I was not writing a pitch email in that, but um, I try to do things that are around my family as much as I can and that suit my lifestyle and um, and my health situation as it evolves. So maybe some of you can relate to that. So I've been creating flexible work resources for people who are specifically who are also parents. So that has been uh, across the board from speaking at events, planning pop up events. This photo is from Algonquin College in the center. So I went into their dare district and set up a children's play area, brought in guest speakers, and then I was invited to do that at Invest Ottawa Bayview Yards as well. Since the pandemic has started in March 2020, or been it was started before then, but since it was declared a global pandemic, I transitioned to virtual and just started creating resources for people based on my experiences as a freelancer, because I realized that a lot of people hadn't done remote work before and maybe you know, wanted to adjust their routines so that they could try to find a flow that worked for them. So I did a bit of resources uh, and then decided finally, it's pretty sad. I've been wanting to podcast for like 10 years. I've done radio interviews and things in that time, but I just never hit record or never hit publish. So in uh, August, I decided, you know what? I'm gonna just launch this, even though I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to make it easy for myself and I'm going to share the workflow that I use so that I can create more content and do it in seasons and do it in small chunks of time. So if that is a, a barrier that you're currently experiencing. And so I launched the podcast officially in November of 2020 and I'm preparing to launch season three in November of 2021. And since then it's gotten some great exposure and has helped me, um, grow my audience and connect with other entrepreneurs who are also leaders and parents. And the whole idea was I wanted to still connect people to the guest speakers that I would have invited to speak at the pop-up events. And I wanted them to be able to still get that content and for it to not just be standard business advice that maybe isn't very relevant to you if you're up five times in the night or you, uh, you can't do the 4 a.m. miracle morning because you're just so exhausted. Uh, or you can't, you, you're like, I don't have time to read Blue Ocean Strategy or any of these, <laughs> these books, just give me the, the cliff notes on your experience. So I wanted to chat to people who had, were a bit further along than me. And so far, I've been able to interview over 10 people across the first two seasons. And I'm looking forward to continuing to share those stories. So it's called Mixing Babies in Business. And you can access it on all the different platforms. So question for you, and Carrie might want to call out these answers. Um, but why are you interested in podcasting? What made you sign up for this session today? Or, you know, if you're already listening to a lot of podcasts, why do you like podcasts? I imagine there's typing happening right now. <laughs> Yeah. as we are in a slight lull <laughs> okay I could exit and see you know oh I'm watching that there okay so someone said um, so Viral who is um saying I'm working with research researchers and mm -hmm. want their stories to be heard Barbara says she's feeling behind the eight ball she wants to know what the possibilities are Paula says I can talk and talk and talk Teresa says, I like listening to honest conversations about ideas, and I like to talk to interesting people. Can I just speak my answer? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Go ahead, Courtney. Okay. <laughs> Go for um, it. <laughs> for me personally, I wanted to start a podcast because uh, I am a mortgage agent, and a lot of the clients that I serve actually don't understand mortgages or the process. So I really wanted to reach out to people and sort of like take away the veil and the mysteriousness of mortgages. And then also myself, I listen to podcasts daily. Like I can't clean my house without a podcast. Like it has to be there. So nice. Why not? <laughs> love, says she, love says she's the owner of Love Custom Design. Uh, she's, I, I don't know if this is about the podcast one, but um, let me just see. Into custom sewing, Victoria says, I want to know about options for the art gallery portrait studio I'm opening. 
Ada says the research we're doing in new technology is something she'd like to share. And she'd like to share the work of other researchers. Law says the, her purpose is that she's in the entertainment industry, which has changed. And she needs ideas for connecting with her followers as well. She has a business development company that seeks expansion in the new virtual world. So lots of great answers there, Amy. All great. I'm going to go over um, some of the pros and cons that I think happen with podcasting, but I love that someone said talking as well, because I used to get in trouble a lot as a kid for talking in class or having too much to say. And I did a lot of reading and a lot of writing, and then I ended up in journalism. And so you see a lot of people now talking about their experience as entrepreneurs or as podcasters that they usually got in trouble for sharing their opinion, being too much, you know, being too chatty. That's great. You have a natural affinity to speak into a microphone, to share your message. And it is a great opportunity, I think, to practice your elevator pitch and explain what you do as a business. So why I podcast personally, for the same reasons that I write, for self-expression, for out of necessity, wanting to connect with people, especially during a time when we've been even more isolated than you would normally be as a, a new parent. Uh, for problem solving, I like to ask people, I'm very curious, maybe I'm nosy, but I like to know, well, how did you do that? And what should I avoid <laughs> if I try to do it? Or what didn't work out for you? Because, you know, everybody's situation is different, but it might help you along your journey. And I also like to do it to fail forward. So it hasn't always been comfortable for me. There's been things that go wrong, tech fails, all that stuff, a uh, bit of nerves, you're learning on the fly, but that is really how I, I learn best. And I, I like to get out of my comfort zone. So some reasons why you might want to consider podcasting, I've broken it into personal and professional, because I think it's also important to think of, you know, if you're going to get out of bed every day and start podcasting or try to be consistent with it, it's good to have a bit of a personal reason as well. So it could be to learn something new. It could be to clarify your message, your um, your elevator pitch to work on defining well what really resonates with people of the products and services that I'm offering or what are the pain points that keep coming up if you are interviewing other guest speakers. Um, and so I mean that's more professional but even clarifying your message of well who am I and what do I care about and what are my values and what's important to me and what kind of impact do I want to make and um, growing your audience could really be, um, you know, that's also a bit professional, but to me, it's right now, it's been about connection and growing your network because there's some, you could say it's opened up a lot in that you can connect with people worldwide, but it's a very different type of connection if you're used to going to the face-to-face -face networking events and conferences and being in a, an environment around other humans. So it can be a way of feeling that human connection and to also feel more you so you can embody more of the person you feel you are and show up you're you're using your voice you're literally using your you know uh, something that might be restricted throughout your lifetime or you might be hesitant to share you are practicing discovering what you care about and what you want to share and talk about from a professional point of view if you're a numbers person so I looked up this stat from 2021, and as of 2021, there were 2 million podcasts worldwide, but there were 600 million blogs. And two years ago, that was only half a million. So it's quadrupled in the last two years. So if you think, oh, I'm too late, and if you're like me, oh, I've been thinking about this for five years or 10 years, and I've been wanting to do it for a while, you're not too late. It's still very early. It is not oversaturated. There are many categories you could select. So for example, mine is a mixture of parenting, entrepreneurship, and you know, we could say business or startup category. There are opportunities for you to really drill down to what your, your niche is and to be at the top of your niche or to be a thought leader in your niche and to uh, be a go-to person. So as Carrie mentioned, I attended a, a virtual cafe hosted by Weekend, and it was about just sharing what podcasts you listen to. 
And I was sharing all the ones I listened to and talking about my experience podcasting. And, um, and now I'm presenting this session. And this has happened to me before with other things where if you're, you're getting into it early and you are practicing as you go, you might have other speaking opportunities or business opportunities that come from it. So I think that that's a good one to note. Uh, the fact that it's accessible worldwide. So if your business market is global or if your message or your pain point is relevant to people in other countries or locations, your content will be more accessible. It's very low barrier to entry. I use a lot of free software. Uh, it is time consuming if you're doing it all yourself, but it, other than the time that it requires, if you want to keep it low cost, I think that is very low barrier to entry, just like social media presents the opportunity that you can just live stream from your phone and connect with potential customers. And it can augment your current content strategy. So I've been blogging for the last 10 years and you could say, well, why don't you just speak out the blog content that you've written over the last 10 years? So if you already have a bank of content from newsletters or pitches or you know award applications, start looking at what you already have and how you could either integrate it into a podcast or use a podcast to supplement the other things that you're doing. And some people do a podcast as that is their hundred percent, their whole business and they don't do anything else. So there's different, lots of different models, but I use it personally to add to my content marketing strategy. So the benefits, I've started with the benefits and I don't want to scare you off with the, with the cons, but the benefits that I see are building your brand awareness and your thought leadership, positioning yourself in your industry, connecting with influencers and people that maybe you don't think would respond to you. I, um, I don't think I've had, I've asked someone to speak at an event before and it conflicted with what they were doing. But so far in everything that I've done, every, every speaker that I've reached out to for an event or a podcast interview has said yes. So if you think, well, this person doesn't have time or they're not going to respond to me or they don't know who I am, you would be surprised. So just have a look at you know, people that are inspiring you in your industry, look at the previous media opportunities that they've had. And maybe if they're already on some podcasts, the type of topics that they speak about and don't reject yourself before you even send the pitch email or the cold message. And I've done a lot of cold messaging on LinkedIn um, and, you know, building my network that way and via email. But a lot of people aren't even promoting the fact that they would be open to a podcast interview. So it is a great way to connect with people and to build your network. You can reach a new audience that, you know, I've been writing my newsletters for a while and they have a great open rate, but not everybody wants to read a newsletter. And especially now I've noticed during the pandemic, my newsletter open rates have dropped. I feel like people, they're just getting so much information all the time. A lot of it is digital. A lot of it is through your inbox. And people, a lot of people treat their inbox as sacred. So you want to respect that space with a podcast. If it's being pushed out on different channels through, for example, Spotify, iTunes, all these different platforms, they can choose, they're choosing to subscribe if they want to follow your podcast or download your episodes, but you're taking up, we'll say real estate on their phone. So I regularly have to delete episodes and things that I've downloaded on my phone because I run out of space because they take quite a bit of space, but someone has invited you into their life to hear your voice, to hear your opinions and into their car, or as someone mentioned into their home when they're doing other things in the background. So you can connect with people in a very unique way. No one's going to drive their car reading your newsletter at the same time. So I just think that that is a very unique opportunity. You can promote your work. So a lot of people will link to either a download or a program or, um, you know, their business services in the episode. If, um, if that is the purpose of the podcast, uh, there are other people who just get sponsors and then some people who don't do that at all. Um, some people believe that if you share a value and you show up, then you don't always have to have a lead magnet or call to action, but it is good if you can just mention your website. 
or how people can get in touch with you. A lot of people are doing a bit more casual things now around uh, send me a DM about this episode or you can find me on Instagram and that's where I hang out a lot of the time. So connect with me if you liked anything about this episode. And that can be a really nice way of interacting with the actual humans who are listening to your podcast. I find subscribers um, you know, based on the, the stats and the content that you're putting out, subscribers are loyal. So if they like your message, they like how you talk about it and they like the style of your show, they will usually follow or subscribe, download, and keep anticipating when those episodes will be released. As I mentioned already, it can help you refine your message and niche down even further or explore a topic that maybe you've been wanting to explore and you don't really know a lot about. You can do that through your podcast or you can use it to inform others. So somebody, um, I can't remember the specific businesses that were, were mentioned in the chat, but if you are a subject matter expert or you have, uh, you mentioned the mortgage specialist, um, if people don't understand how the process works, you can really talk them through that. You can humanize your business. So it's not just, you know, it's your voice and it's your, if you want to put your face on the artwork, it's, it's really a different way of connecting with you. And that's another reason why I also like, I've seen more people using voice notes and audio forms of messaging and coaching or connection. And I, I think it's a nice avenue to explore if you're not fully wanting to invest in podcasting yet. You could just try out, well, how does my audience respond to audio form communications? Because it can be as simple as, for example, in WhatsApp or Instagram, just holding down the mic button and recording a nice personalized message. And I've had, I've been pleasantly surprised, I will say, when I've signed up for something. One was a, a LinkedIn B2B challenge on how to reach out to more similar businesses in your industry. And the person who was running the challenge when I joined sent me a voice note on LinkedIn and said, Hey, Amy, I've been looking at your page. And she mentioned some of the stuff about my profile and, Oh, love what you're doing with this. And she had taken the time to look at my profile, reach out to me and record that. Maybe it was 30 seconds of her day, but then I was interested and I was going to be opening her emails more likely because I know who she is now and I know what she sounds like and I think that she cares. So something to think about and practicing your public speaking. If you're looking to get rid of your ums or your as, or you want to just listen back to things that maybe you know, critique your own speaking, I think that it can be a good way to do that. You don't want to get too critical with yourself. But a lot of the things that you think are terrible, people don't notice or they don't mind, but it can be a good way of just practicing your delivery, practicing your questioning style or the way that you summarize your information and a great way for you to generate new content. So from one episode, you can create so many different pieces of content. You can have audio notes, you can have visuals. If you record a video podcast, you can have a YouTube channel you can share all of your stuff on social media, of course, and through your newsletter and through your blog, but then you can also package up your episodes or look at the stats on, well, what was the topic that people really cared about the most? And you can use that to inform your research for developing new products and services. So there's so many different things that you can do from your podcast episodes. Now the cons. So I hope I know we have an hour and a half and last time I did a session about podcasting, it was like really tight in an hour. So I hope that everyone still with me, still enjoying themselves. So, but if you have questions throughout, do type them in the chat and we will be pausing a few times to brainstorm different ideas and share. And then at the end, we can ask more detailed questions, but if it's relevant to what we're talking about now, then just go for it, share your questions. Um, so the downsides of getting into podcasting, this is as, as I see it, and also as some, you know, if you Google downsides of getting pod into podcasting, you'll come up with a few articles on that. But from what I've seen in the last year and a bit of doing it myself, you know, it can be a steep learning curve. And with that comes for me, like inner critic, oh my goodness, why, why can't I figure this out? If you're troubleshooting or if there's IT things or tech things, you're just, you might berate yourself for a while why does this person's podcast sound so great? Or this looks so easy. And 
it is a steep learning curve. So you've got to cut yourself some slack or outsource <laughs> and do it. Find someone who, who loves doing it or a studio that specializes it in it. Uh, it can be time consuming. I think the stat is around uh, for every minute of audio, it can take five to six or more minutes of editing time. So for me, I personally, I usually have a 30 minute interview with people and I split it up and I go into that in more detail, but you want to really block off your time if you're going to be sitting and doing edits, because it's not something that I find easy to come back to and your computer might crash if you have too much software running at the same time. Uh, I do believe it's like four jobs in one. So I go over the four jobs in the next few slides. Um, it requires consistency. So just like anything you're doing with content marketing, people might come to expect, oh, the episodes usually come out on this day. Oh, why didn't it come out? And I've even seen some people whose audiences will contact them and be like, are you all right? Uh, your newsletter didn't come out this week or didn't. <laughs> and that's awesome if your audience is that invested in what you're saying. But just know that if you're going to commit to something, it's fine to change your mind. It's fine to say, look, this isn't working for me anymore, or I don't want to do this anymore. But if you're going to start out with it, just be honest with yourself around, well, what's like the minimum level of consistency that I can commit to? And that is still going to be fun for me because you don't want to create another job for yourself. That is not enjoyable. That's not the point of podcasting. You just want to have fun and explore something new. It can become expensive. So I have a microphone that is from Staples in Canada. It's a blue snowball. I'll hold it up here. It was, I think, $70 Canadian, including tax or something. Not very expensive. It's a USB microphone. I don't have the big arm set up with the fluffy soundproofer. I don't have a padded wall in my office. I don't make a mattress fort around myself with pillows <laughs> because my kids would be in here body slamming each other and that would just be counterproductive. So I just try to, you know, I like this because if I ever decide to go on the road or go traveling and say, oh, I want to keep doing my podcast, I could just use my laptop. That's almost 10 years old and it would still work. Uh, the software that I use uh, is free, but there is paid software, of course, that you can use and paid memberships or studio memberships that you can use for auditing or not auditing, editing time. I, I say auditing because the software I use is Audacity, uh, but you can buy blocks of recording and editing time or, you know, get someone to do that for you on a retainer, but that can become expensive. The, uh, the headphones I have, I'll just grab them here. I do have pictures of them too, but I got these, um, they're Audio Technica. I think they were under a hundred or 150, but they have nice cushions. I'm going to hold them up to the screen here. Super nice padding on your ears. I found that was very important, especially if you're going to be editing for two hours, for example. Uh, but you can get a lot of the tools at uh, music stores. People who are into recording music or have their own studios at home will have nicer gear than um, some other stores. But just note that, and I would say don't go too wild with your spending at the start because you just might realize that you don't enjoy podcasting when you get into it. So it can become untimely. So like with your gear, it, it could stop working because it could become untimely or your software might not update anymore. Your episodes might also become, become untimely. So I try to ask people questions that I feel will be pretty universal or relatable because I don't, you know, if I say that, but right now a lot of my topics are around the pandemic and how people have adjusted their workflow. But I feel like that'll still be relevant when people don't want to spend 60 hour weeks at an office or want to spend more time with their families or want to have a different approach to their life. So I still feel like that'll be relevant. I don't try to talk about, um, you know, we talk about some political things, but a lot of it again is, is timely and it's going to be relevant in future. So when I say untimely, I'm thinking more the software that you're using, if you're telling people to do a certain, you're recommending a certain mortgage or a certain rate or a certain uh, type of paint if you're an interior designer or a certain method for something that can become untimely. So you just want to think about how can I do the podcast so that it will be relevant still for a couple of years and people find it and still want to listen. 
audio is tiring to edit. You physically get really tired because you are, you're going to be tired after listening to me talk for this session because you're active listening. And when you're editing, you're active listening to your own voice, but you're also listening for mistakes. And then you're trying to edit those things out and you just, you get physically a lot more tired than if you're just passively listening to a podcast on your phone or your device. Recording issues do happen. I had an interview set up for yesterday with someone who's in a different time zone and we tried two different times and both times uh, her microphone was having issues. It was weird. It was like a, a record skipping and we both couldn't figure out. We used three different platforms to test. We tried Zoom. We tried the platform I use for my podcast, Zencaster, and we tried Google Meet and it happened on everything. So we knew it was the device itself or her software, but these things happen. And so you want to, if you're committing to weekly episodes or your interview schedule is really tight, you want to give yourself some grace around these kind of issues happening and maybe batch your content or have things ready a few weeks in advance. Guests can cancel, same thing, especially now. Everybody's having to do tests last minute or change their schedule around just like I had to in the summer. So you just want to buffer for that. It may take a while to grow. Don't get disappointed if your metrics are slow to start. Things build over time and you might lose momentum or it might lose momentum if you're not publishing regularly. So just think about those things, honestly, and how you like to operate as an entrepreneur or a founder um, or an employee and what kind of energy levels you have and can commit to. So I'm going to start with some podcast interview tips. If you are wanting to dip your toe in the water that way and try to be a guest first before you fully commit to buying all the stuff. This is a photo of a studio in Ottawa that I went to. I did a recording of my book. I did an audio book. And the great thing about this experience was I, I was able to do it faster because I'd been podcasting for a while. And I, I just knew, you know, to clap or do things that would make it easier in the editing process. So that's an example of learning as you go, failing forward and, you know, getting better with practice, but this is what a traditional studio might look like. So through the window, you can see they have the recording area with a mic. It's much more relaxing because you don't see any of the, the software stuff going on in the background. And then they take care of the edits for you. So if you are going to be a guest on a podcast or a radio show, I would recommend that you are strategic. So if you're pitching yourself to other shows or if people are approaching you, some people start off with saying, oh, I just say, I say yes to every opportunity because I want to spread my message. So you could do that, but you could also look at shows that are related to your industry or your core offering and your niche your ideal customer avatar, what kind of shows are they listening to or what kind of topics would they be interested in? What aligns with what you're currently offering and what topics would you say that you're a subject matter expert on or that you can really help people with or that you're just really passionate about? And how can you help them and why, why would they want to interview you? So if you're pitching yourself to other podcasts, it's great if you have all these achievements and I get, it's funny cause I didn't expect to get a lot of pitches but I've been getting quite a few pitches from people. And a lot of the time the pitch is about them, their awards, their background, what they do but not really about, well, what will the parents listening get out of this? So think about your host and their show and what they're trying to do. And their key message, listen to the trailer, at least, hopefully it's like one minute long or less than two minutes long. And why would they want to interview you instead of another person who specializes in that industry? And how can you help them promote it? How can you help share the content um, with your audience? So like with any business interaction, it can't be all take, take, take. What are you going to give? as well, what value can you provide? So keep in touch with your host. If you are booked in and you are confirmed to be a guest, keep in touch with your host if it's you know a bit far out so that you know what to expect. So I let people know what to expect in advance and when I'm gonna be sending things. But if they don't let you know that, you can feel free to ask. 
listen to a few of their episodes so that you know the style if of their questioning style. If they're not going to send you questions in advance, you can confirm that with them as well. You, some people will say like, you have to send the questions in advance. And so that's up to you um, as a guest, if you want to demand that. And they may say yes or no. <laughs> so just be prepared. But you can always prep a few of your own questions in advance too. So things that you preempt, they might ask or some situations, you know, when you're in a job interview and they say use the STAR method with the situation task um, action and results. So you can have a few of those stories ready to go where you have some anecdotes of, well, this happened to me and this is why I developed this product or this is the why my business went into this direction and this was maybe a transformation point and why I'm passionate about doing what I'm doing now. And ask about the publication date. So you're going to want to know um, when is it coming out so you can share it with your network and how uh, you can share it. So I provide artwork and links for people, but you ideally will be tagged on social media or sent a link to the file, and then you'll be able to share it with your newsletter or on your website or on your media page. So in terms of providing value, um, I think it's always good to be generous. Some people say like, give them all your goodies or give them like, don't hold anything back. And really, if you're only talking for under an hour and the person to work with you needs to work with you for longer or needs to buy a specific thing that you're offering, they're not gonna get all your secrets in an hour. They're just gonna get to know you a bit better. And so how can you help them in the shortest amount of time? I like to pretend I'm speaking to a friend or having coffee with a friend, just keep it relaxed because otherwise I might get into like, I'm not speaking from my diaphragm. I might be speaking you know, from up here and be a bit shaky. Likewise, I stay away from coffee. So I, I mentioned to Carrie when we first logged on, my throat's a bit ticklish this week from like, maybe I'm yelling at my kids more <laughs> to say, we gotta go. But I think it's um, good to stay away from certain foods and drinks before an interview, especially if your voice like mine will get scratchy and warbly like it is now. So I've been drinking herbal tea and you can have honey and hot water and all that stuff. But certain foods too will you know, don't eat a peanut butter sandwich right before an interview because your mouth is like, it's not going to be a good situation. So think about if you were to go on stage and present at a conference, what you would do, how you would sleep the night before, how you would mentally prepare. And I like to look after myself before I'm doing an interview or a guest speaking thing, because if I'm tired, I'm just not going to have the recall that I want. And I want to make sure that I'm relaxed. So uh, I already mentioned what did listeners need to know, but you could also drill down more to the practical, like what is your call to action? What do you absolutely want them to know? What are you offering in the next couple of weeks or months that you want them to go and look at? Keep it clear. Uh, keep it easy for people. Don't, you know, if you have a website that's so long forward slash something else dash something else, let's create a bit.ly or a shorter link or, you know, make something on your website or get someone to do it for you. That is really easy to say and really easy to link to in the show notes, because as I've realized your show notes have character counts and it is great if you can have those limits under control and most importantly, show up as yourself and have fun. So the best part about podcasting is if it's not a video one and you don't have to turn your camera on, you can be wearing whatever you want and whatever is the most comfortable. So right now, I am wearing, like, I kind of look like Jane Fonda from here down because I'm wearing my, like, workout clothes. And I was like, that's good because I want to be comfortable because I'm pregnant. And so what I love about podcasting is I don't have to worry about standing up on a stage and everybody assessing, well, what am I wearing and how am I standing? And, oh, my feet are sore. I can wear my slippers if I want. So I think that you should just make it comfortable, uh, show up as yourself, have fun, Maybe give yourself a little reward after if you found it to be a stressful experience. So guest interview tips for research opportunities. I personally don't use any of these, but these are a few things that email me or that if you search for how to be a guest on podcast, they'll come up, but some are paid, some are free. So they have different levels, but the first three are free. So Podmatch, Podchaser, Matchmaker, 
dot fm. Uh, the only downside to I think it was pod match. Um, because I'm seasonal, my last episode was released in May. So some of them want you to have at least one episode a month for you to be able to be on their matching software. So just think of that. If you're planning to pitch at a certain time, make sure that it's during the season that you have episodes up there. Podcasthawk.com is a new one that I actually heard on a podcast from a founder that he developed because he was finding this was becoming a problem, people wanting to pitch on other podcasts. And so he created his own software just because he's a serial entrepreneur and you have to pay for it. I think it's about 45 or $50 US a month and I haven't used it. So I can't testify to the value or anything, but he's trying to solve a problem in the marketplace. So you could check out that one. And then there's also Facebook groups. So there's she podcasts and women who podcast. If you're looking for more information, However, she podcasts, you cannot pitch, you cannot ask to be a guest, you cannot, you know, DM people or anything. And women who podcast will have a, a regular thread that you have to comment under. So make sure you read the group rules or you'll get kicked out and treat it as a sacred space because you don't want to be in there pitching everyone and, you know, not contributing to the value of the group. But there are they're all good ways to even just research other competitors in your industry. So with Podmatch or matchmaker.fm, you can look at different podcasts by categories and by industry. So you can see, oh, well, how many episodes did they have? And instead of just going straight through iTunes, if you don't have an Apple device or if you don't want to search on Spotify. So that can be helpful for your research. And as I said before, it's okay to be too much. So I love this quote from the Being Boss uh, website, and it is also a podcast that has many, like hundreds of episodes. Um, it has changed format in the last year, but I love that podcast and they have great interviews with creatives who are also entrepreneurs and be willing to be too much is something I tell myself a lot because if you get the, the self-doubt or um, you're like, oh, should I hit publish on this? It might be a bit controversial, or I don't know if this is too much information. You just don't know who is going to resonate with what you've said. So, you know, be measured if you want. But I feel like there are a lot of people doing the same thing in your industry as you. So why do they care about you? That is a great reason to be too much in your podcast because you want them to come and find you, right? So things that I like to focus on with all of my content. So this is something that I um, do across, like I'm not a very, I don't want to say I'm not a very strategic or operational person, but I don't like anything more than the whole one page plan. And a lot of the time the plan is in my head or I, I actually take out my diary and I go, okay, this is when I'm going to plan this season. And I just look at the days of the week and I just feel like if I plan too much, it's too easy for me to just go, eh, I don't feel like doing that anymore. I'm not accountable to my own deadlines, which is the problem. So if you're like me, <laughs> then you might want to think through these things. But, um, but if you're really accountable to yourself, then congratulations, because you will be great at podcasting. <laughs> so I like to think of who is going to be listening to this? Who am I talking to? And you know, why do they care? So that's your tone and your audience. So for me, I personally swear a lot as, as a person. And since having kids, I don't swear as much around them. I really try not to, but on my podcast, I don't swear because I just know, okay, these are parents. They might have it like me playing while they're doing other things around the house. And, and I do have other parenting podcasts that they do say explicit language. They're swearing. That's fine. People still love it, but I just don't always know if my kids can hear. So, and I want to respect my audience in that way. Otherwise there are tools, you know, you, you have to say if there's adult content or explicit content, so don't worry, you'll be covered, but just think about that and um, who you want to attract. What do they need to know right now? So the whole what's in it for me by listening to this episode. So I try to think about that in terms of my, my title, which you only have so many characters for. So the episode title, the guest, the types of questions that I ask them, like what would this person if they went to see them at a guest speaking event, what kind of questions would the audience want to know that maybe they're not going to cover in their keynote? 
Um, what next steps do they need to take? So that's your call to action. And how often are you going to be in touch with them after the fact? So uh, I like to let people know in the show description. So my episodes are published every Tuesday and Friday when it is in season. So people know they'll be coming out. And what would they want? Uh, why would they want to stay or get involved? So by joining your podcast or following your podcast, like why would they want to become a loyal follower or what kind of experience are you trying to create for them? So some that you listen to will be like being on a mini retreat or vacation. Some people have very relaxing voices. They have been, uh, you know, hypnotherapy coaches previously, you can tell because their voice is just very calming. And then other people... <laughs> or guess, you know, really fiery, you'll be listening to it and say, yeah, that is a problem in business. And you, you know, you, you get fired up about it or it makes you want to take action. So what kind of experience do you want your listeners to have when they're listening to your podcast? So I'm about a quarter of the way through my slides right now. So we're going to do a brainstorm. And if you need to get a drink of water or anything like that, um, please do. But I just want you to grab a pen and paper or your notes on your phone and brainstorm what core topics can you speak about to entice listeners to tune in to you and look forward to your interview. So either as a guest on a podcast or as a host interviewing other people, what core topics you could maybe, I don't know if I've got, here we go, three to five reasons um why you're an expert at what you do so there's two things here so one is a list of what are the topics that you could speak to or the overall themes or categories related to your business that people would be really interested to know and then if you have time if you can write down a few reasons why they should listen to you instead of anybody else why are you the expert and how can you help them so I don't know if I should just leave up this one or the other ones. The other one was just overarching categories. And then this one is specifically, but why you? I'm just gonna have a, a tea break. And then afterwards, if you can share them in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself and carry, um, you know, can go through everyone. If that's not too much, um, then we could do that, but I just don't know how that would work. So ideally just put a few of your reasons in the chat to start with. I'm sorry, I should have had some relaxing ambiance music to play in the background while you brainstorm, but I was not thinking. Amy, mm -hmm. it's Paula. Um, Carrie just messaged me to say that she's having some technical issues. Okay, no yeah. worries. I'm oh, going she's to back. Be I'm back. <laughs> Carrie, I didn't even know you popped off. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so if everyone could share in the chat, uh, if they want to, what categories or overarching topics could you speak about? as a, either a guest speaker or a host to entice listeners to look forward to your interview. And then some reasons why you, why you are the subject matter expert or how you can specifically help them. So if you're comfortable sharing, this is a chance for you to pump yourself up and promote yourself. Why you are the person someone should interview about these topics. So I don't see any chat coming through at the moment, but an example of what I would say are, I talk about remote and flexible work, bringing kids into business settings. And lately I've been talking a lot about my own creative practices or workflows, but those are the things that people ask me to speak about. And why me? Because I've been remote working since 2014 and been bringing my kids into business settings since they were a few weeks old. And so I have lots of stories to tell about those specific things. Great. And I see Paula has her hand up. Paula, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. 
Sure. Um, I guess I just had the thought of, um, I'm all about animals and health and wellness, and I completely lost what I was going to say. <laughs> um, because, well, it's the health and wellness, and it's the unfiltered. Like the why me? I'm unfiltered. I'm going to say, I've had people say, oh, it'd be so lovely to have a puppy or a dog because it's cute stuff. I'm like, no, that's not why you do it. It's hard. It's unreasonable. And, and I, I'm going through it. Like why get a third puppy or a third dog? Because I want to add to my family and to give the advantages and yeah. And that, you know, be wise about what you purchase. Just like with children, dogs don't have to have everything on the market. No, that's a good one, Paula, because yeah. you can really create your own niche of the, yeah. Like and the puppy, dogs, puppy police of why not yeah. to, to do well, it. And dogs aren't that much different than a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. True. So, yeah. It's a great podcast episode. <laughs> um, Courtney, you also have your hand up. Courtney, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so my core topics, immediately I came to mind the myth of pre-approvals. That's a big one I want to talk people out of. Um, the Also, everybody's a rate shopper, so getting the best rates and why I need your docs, because I answer that question literally every day. So I'd love to put it in a podcast. Um, the reasons why you want to listen to me, I am not only a residential mortgage agent, but I'm also the sales team leader in Ontario for my brokerage. Uh, I work for the largest full service brokerage uh, in Canada. We have award-winning service nationwide. All of our offices are either in the East Coast, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and Nunavut. So we cover everybody. So our knowledge base is there. We have over 30 years of experience behind us. So if you distill that for people, why they would want to listen to you or how you can help them, you may want to focus on, um, I can get your mortgage approved faster, or I have the experts. If you're buying a house in another province or territory and you live in a different province and territory, I can help you do that because I have someone to connect you with, as opposed to the awards and accolades. That's important to mention in a bio, but um, someone else, I think it's Tony has, has listed something similar where it's her credentials and her interests, which, which are important. But when I read hers, which is uh, entrepreneurship, work-life balance, self-published author, and why me, I'm celebrating my 20th year of business and I've built my own opportunities. I want to know, well, how did you build those opportunities? What did you do to to do that or when things got hard how did you decide to stay in business for 20 years so think of it from the listener perspective of um or or a so, friend who's being really nosy and wants to know well how did you do that as opposed to just what do you do so okay good to start so like start with the what but, and then go down to but what's in it for them why but, why you Right. My question, because like mostly the podcast that I'm thinking of starting would be um, basically like educational about mortgages and how, and especially like business for self for like women as well. So mm -hmm. why I based those reasons on there was like, I have the experience and expertise. That's why you should listen to me. Mm -hmm. And so you're it's, it's talking, important. make it more personal. Is that your advice there? Um. For me personally, as a listener, I, I would want to know, yeah, just what, what am I going to get out of? So you're talking about education and information. So if people are going to leave feeling more informed, then that's, a, that's an outcome. So it's really just looking at um, the outcomes that you want people to have from listening. Oh, to okay. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. I know there's sorry, some yeah. in the chat and uh, law also yeah. has her hand up that you probably okay. see, but I know there's some answers in the chat too. Okay, well, um, I'll read Barbara's out and then La, if you want to go after Barbara. So Barbara says goal setting and actionable plans to win, increasing profitability through increasing stats of conversion, average sales and traffic, um, image through wellness, fashion and cosmetics. So Barbara, uh, those are all tangible things people can learn about from listening to your podcast. I would just hone down a bit on why are you the person that they should listen to with those topics. Um, but those are good for in terms of outcomes. And La, if you want to. Okay, can you hear me okay? 
I can. Wonderful, wonderful, and good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, you and well, as I indicated a little bit earlier, I, I'm in the entertainment industry, namely the music industry. And um, one of the core topics, and thank you so very much because it helped me to start thinking about that, it's regarding safety, uh, which is in the forefront of all persons in terms of live in-person uh, concerts. So my core topic was the new inventive or creative way of your next live in-person experience and the overall safety. Um, one of the reasons why is because reports are uh, ever-changing regarding the uh, gathering uh, and the caution of a gathering in large groups. Uh, the next step that I have here is wanting to learn how to ease back into large groups because certain ages are more conscious than others and to address the why uh, behind that as well. Uh, regarding what to expect at your next in-person concert and how to actually safely interact with persons uh, uh, around. So that is what I have come up with. That is great. There's a, a podcaster that I follow who he calls it the bleeding neck problem, which sounds a bit intense, but really you're trying to talk about, um, you know, when you're talking about people's pain points, what urgent thing do they need to solve? And you've talked about that very well in terms of people's concerns or their fears around re-entering spaces. So um, thank you for sharing. We have uh, Amy and then I think Jackie is the last one. Hi, um, actually I need some time to work on the, uh, the these brainstorming. I That's need okay. a, a little bit more time. Basically, I just want to ask you, I got the question there, but somehow probably Carrie missed it. I would like to know, I'm completely newbie and uh, it sounds kind of lots of thing to do. And uh, I wanted to know, uh, how do you prepare? For example, I think you probably asked, but uh, sorry, you, prob you probably answered, but I'm just thinking, do you need to write a script before you go live, even like a Zoom meeting, for example? Um, I will talk about that with my workflow because okay. I'm just looking at the clock and it's 11 and we have half okay. an hour. So I'm going to go, I, the way my slides work, I have put a lot of detail on them and I'm not going to read it all out, but it's just, if people aren't, um, through your learning style, isn't listening, I just wanted to have it there for everyone. And if Carrie's sharing the recording and slides after, then it'll go through all of that. And again, it's very personal, what comes more naturally to you. And it's very trial and error. So, um, I am going to just read out Jackie's. Thank you for that question, though. Right, that thank is a good you. One. It's a very good one. And it's changed a lot over the years, how I do things. So depending on my energy levels and sleep levels. Uh, so Jackie has said core topics, mental health, employee mental health, how to attract and retain employees, work-life balance for entrepreneurs. She's an expert because she spent her whole career working in the mental health field, has helped several family members and has experienced burnout. So yes, that's good. You have a personal thread uh, to that. So this next, you know, this is a bit pixelated, but this is another quote from Being Boss, and this might summarize it a bit better. But as human beings, our DNA is story-based. That's how we communicate information to each other. So think of the information you want to communicate, the call to action that you want people to take, but try to weave it into a story because people will be able to remember or recall the key points and you know the arc of the story where you you've had your challenge there was a crisis or there was a, a problem that needed to be solved this was the solution this is what happened and if you can weave it into something that is based on you know a relatable experience that you've had it'll be easier for you to talk about as well so i did have a two minute break in here but i'm going to skip over this one because we kind of covered it but it's something that i would like you to do if we have time at the end or after this session. So this is a challenge that I like to give myself. It, I got it from uh, attending a meeting with someone who was trying to help me launch. It was when I was pregnant the last time and they were trying to help me launch um, what, I, what later became mixing babies in business. So they just said, what could you do in, um, what could you launch in the next 24 or 48 hours? So at the time it was a newsletter landing page. So I just wanted to keep it simple, but the way I like to also apply it is, well, what could I tell someone 
So the information I'm going to tell you today in the next 24 to 48 hours, if you want to start registering a podcast or drafting a script or, you know, planning it out, you could go and do that. So I'm trying to give you information that in the next two days, you can take some concrete actions. So that's another way I like to think about it, going into interviews or pitching yourself as a guest. So what are those stories that would really make a difference in someone's life? So if you want to, if you want to type them into the chat, we won't unmute ourselves this time because I'm going to go through the workflow. But if you want to throughout this, um, you know, share your thoughts on some stories that that are like Jackie, what Jackie has just said there, how she's experienced burnout herself and can talk to that or helping her family members that will help you connect to listeners, please do. But it's totally up to you. So um also, if there isn't a market for the topics that you want to podcast about or that you want to pitch to, that's why I created what I've created, because there might not be a market that's clearly defined for what you do. So for me, I could pitch to parenting podcasts or I could pick, pitch to entrepreneurship or business, but there's no clear, there's not a lot that makes both. So it's okay if you need to create your own market by combining two categories or more. So these are the four jobs that I'm going to go over that I have discovered uh, I've created for myself. And I kind of knew some of them would happen based on other content marketing and things that I've done. But with podcasting, it's a bit different because you're, you're really like your broadcast production. So you're, you can take out some of these jobs if you want, if you want to hire a virtual assistant or if you have budget to pay for a podcast studio um, at the time, I believe. The podcast studio that I could have used was reopening, but for a period in the pandemic, they were forced to close. So it's something that you need to also think about in terms of if you're using a co-working space, for example, some might offer some editing suites or recording suites, but just always have it in the back of your mind of, well, how would I do this from home if I needed to? And I think someone may have asked me earlier on in the chat about my setup and how I do it from home. So the four jobs I have are planning, Recording, producing, which is the editing and actually putting it all together so that it is listener ready, and then promoting. And these are all photos of my real life. So you can see this is the room that I'm coming to you from now. That is my setup. So planning out your podcast, I like to focus on the style, the length, the tech, and the hosting. So these are some things that I brainstormed before I started buying and I had been listening to podcasts for a really long time and identifying what shows I really liked or kept coming back to or couldn't wait to get in the car to drive somewhere because I really want to hear the rest of that episode um, so questions to ask yourself before you start to plan it out would be what are you trying to achieve so are you trying, some people might say, well, this, I want to make it my core business. I want to just have a podcast as my business model. So then you will take a different approach than someone who's going to be using it for content marketing or to build authority. So you could say, well, I really just want to get more visitors to my website, or I really want to uh, learn something new or challenge myself because, um, or I'm, I'm better with talking. So I want to practice because if I practice, then maybe I'll get more guest speaking opportunities. So you could, it's good to have a goal or some kind of outcome of what you would like to achieve from this. Uh, who will be the voice of your podcast? So some people have someone do their introduction for them. Uh, you could do everything yourself like I do. You could decide, am I going to be, so the format wise, I'm going to be interviewing people. Am I going to just be sharing my own thoughts? Is it going to be a story format? You hear there's the... Um, you know, the true crime type podcast where you're listening to, it's, it's almost like an audio book and you're, you're enticed to come back. So what kind of format do I want to produce and how slash where will I record? So I mentioned the studios, you, there's lots of people who, if they have a closet that has a door that has carpet on the floor, they like to do it in the closet because it is a closed space. You have all your clothes hanging up around you. If you have a closet that is big enough to do that in, and it'll be naturally sound buffered. You also want to have power outlets though, to do that. Um, some people 
have, you know, as one of my guests that I interviewed, uh, they produce a podcast called Doing It for the Kids. That's a sweary one that they talk about parenting and freelance life, but they both, they have two co-hosts. So their format is there's the two of them talking, talking through listener questions that they get through their Facebook group. But during the pandemic, one of them was podcasting from their backyard in the rain or in their car because they had all their kids at home. And, you know, you have to do what you have to do if you're on a schedule and you want to stick to it. So just think about that. Cars can be also padded, you know, buffers. You're obviously going to be parked when you're recording, but uh, again, you want to have enough battery life on your devices. Um, How often will you publish? So that comes down to the schedule question of, well, for me, I think of it as, well, what, what is the minimum viable podcasting really for what I could do during the pandemic. And at the time in August, both our kids were home. I was looking after them, trying to do freelance work around their care. And I blocked out between 12 and one uh, for interviews. And my interviews were scheduled to be 30 minutes because that was the only time I could do them. And then my editing was all done in evenings or weekends. So I based my show's format on the fact that I didn't want to burn out, but I still wanted to create something. So your motivations will be very different depending on your situation. Where will you host it from? So some people use, I use Buzzsprout, some people use Anchor, some people might just publish to their website. There are lots of different platforms that you can explore. And if they're hosting it for you, a lot of them will be paid. Otherwise your episodes might delete after a certain period of time or, um, you know, you might own your content, but you don't know if it's going to disappear. So think about that. Another thing that I like to share is my personal workflow. So this covers the schedule question of how I plan my podcast. So I do the 30 minute interviews. One of them went to an hour, which was actually harder to edit than the 30 minutes, because the way I design it is I want every episode to be under 20 minutes. So I split the 30 minute conversation into three episodes and then I record an intro and an outro and a bit of a teaser to, well, next, next session or next episode, we're going to talk about this. And I try to design my questions. I usually send them about 10 questions. Maybe I ask more, but usually I have to ask less because of the 30 to 40 minute window. And I'm trying to respect everyone's time. And I decided, okay, if I do four guests split into three episodes, that's 12 episodes per season. I can do a season that's you know, a few weeks, I publish twice a week to build momentum. So that gives me, you know, six to 10 weeks per season, potentially, depending on I've had someone come on as a last minute guest. So the season two, I had five um, different guests instead of four. And, um, and then I try to plan it out on my calendar based on, okay, well, when when are good times of year? So I tried not to release episodes over Christmas because I didn't want to be doing that. Um, But the scheduler that I use, you can also pre-plug those in in advance, but you still need to promote it. You still need to let your guests know if you're interviewing people. So I really just based it on what will be fun for me, what will be doable. So I started my interviews in August, but I didn't launch my season until November because I did all my interviews for season one before I launched season one. And then during season one, as I was launching and publishing and editing, I was interviewing people for season two, but then I didn't release season two until February. So I had interviews booked before and after Christmas. And for me, that was just less stressful because then if people ran into issues where they had to cancel or we had tech issues, it was no big deal because I still had a month before I was planning to release that season. I request the interviews four to six weeks out. So I've been emailing people since April and May to interview them now because I understood people are burnt out. They might be taking summer holidays. School is starting for some people. And what's funny is a lot of them said, yeah, I'm super interested. Email me. And then I just didn't over the summer because I got really sick. Um, but it worked out fine because a lot of people were on holiday mode anyways. And then as soon as I was ready to create my booking schedule, it was fine. I sent it out. Boom, boom, boom. I have a couple interviews lined up in September and October. So I know, okay, for season three, I'll probably release that in November so that I give myself time to edit. 
I've included a booking link in the email software that I use. So right now I use You Can Book Me, but I also have Acuity Scheduling. And I let them know I'm going to send the questions in advance because that encourages me. I'm a procrastinator. That encourages me to do the research and write the questions in advance. But also out of respect for my guests, I want them to know, like, I've really thought about these questions. I've really tailored them to you. And is, if there's anything, because I'm talking about people's family life and parenthood, I want to know if there's anything you don't want to talk about, let me know in advance because I just, we can edit it out or I just won't ask. Um, and then I record at home and I use Buzzsprout to host it. And I will just say what happened with Paula earlier where she said, oh, I just, I forgot my thought that I was going to say. That is also fine on podcasting because if that happens with me or with my guest, I can just edit that part out. It's no big deal. So don't think, oh, when I'm doing this interview, or if I fumble over this word that I want to say, or if I lose my train of thought, that's it. It's just, that's how it has to go out because it can be edited out. So you can just re, re ask again, or if <laughs> there was some, um, you know, cat noises in the background of one of my guests interview, and there's some music in one that I just did recently until we realized that it was in the background and um, they shut it off, but th these kind of things will happen. So don't worry about it. Uh, this is a screenshot of my You Can Book Me page that I send people to, and I want them to know in advance. They might not read all this stuff, but I just want to, some of them have executive assistants or personal assistants. Um, they might want to know that information because they're trying to package everything up for them. This, Can I ask you yeah. a quick question? La yeah. had posted, do you suggest, like when it comes to editing, um, do you suggest at any point presenting a live, a live content? Uh, is that advisable? Um, La, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but I don't know if you mean not mm -hmm. editing or. Yeah, so some people will not want to edit their podcast at all and do stream of consciousness podcasting, maybe. But I don't want to do that because I have, a toddler and a five-year-old but at the time they were um yeah around and could have been busting through my doors so it depends on what environment you have for sure uh but do what you want some people may want to just record something on their phone and then be able to upload it and not have to do any of the editing so recording your podcast so the last one i had there tools prep tech and hosting so this these are just overarching, um, yeah, so recording versus live. For me, it's uh, stress and burnout and energy levels, and I have different health conditions that can change. So if I'm pre-recording, then I can manage that. But if it's live and I'm having a bad day, then that's just what's going to happen. So I think that for me, I prefer to do the pre-recorded. And it's still, if I'm having a bad day when I'm doing the recording, I'm still going to you know, it might come through on the, the interview, but at least I can edit the sound so that if the person's background or my background is really disruptive or the mic quality isn't good, I can try to fix that after the fact. Because when you think about it, if I plug my car in, um, you know, my Bluetooth, turn it on and plug my uh, phone into my car and I'm driving and I have my volume settings wrong, some podcasts will just go boom, through your speakers, it'd be super loud or other people. And then the next minute, their guests might be sounding like they're doing the interview from down the hallway and their mics all the way down there. They're very soft spoken. And then there's a tinny sound and then there's an airplane noise and all this. And as you're driving, that's not always the nicest thing to listen to. So I try to think of that uh, from my you're going to be either in someone's earbuds or in their car or in their home. So I try to make it a nice listening experience and um, that takes a bit of effort, but other people just want to get it out and hit publish. So that there's nothing wrong with that. It's just um, you might have drop off with your episodes because people might go, Oh, every time I turn this on, it, like there's a, <laughs> it like almost blew my speakers or whatever. So just think about that. And this, these overview things for recording are less about the gear. I showed you the gear that I use, but focus on quality and reliability. So looking after your stuff, updating your software, making sure that it's the latest version, that you've tested it, um, your environment as much as you can, eliminating background noise because it might, it might come through unless you have a really good microphone. 
that you can kind of drown out that. The internet quality, I have a little booster thing now um, because everybody was at home and we were finding our internet was dropping, but your internet quality can also affect your software or your, your mic and speakers. Um, so just a lot of the platforms will test that initially, like Zencaster will do a, a health check at the beginning for everybody's stuff, which I find is helpful. Looking after your voice, as I already mentioned, depending on what you eat and drink and sleep and it's podcasting has been great for my family because I really don't yell as much as I used to <laughs> because I am a, you know, I'm a vocal person, but I'm now like, oh, maybe I should not strain my voice because I, which is sad because I have to do my podcast, <laughs> but it's made me more intentional with my voice. So that is, I would say that's a positive uh, energy, <laughs> keeping the conversation natural. So if you want to laugh, laugh, if you want to do a script, do a script, but I find when I do a script for guest speaking opportunities, so for this, for example, I don't have a script for this, but I do dot points because then I won't learn, I won't lose my train of thought. I may repeat some things, but I can add to them and I know what I want to add to them, but it'll be different every time. But then I feel like it's more natural. So that's just something that I've learned over the years for me personally. But when I'm with my kids, I've done presenting where I'm wearing my kid or another one is around me. And then I have a script because if I get deer in the headlights moment happening, then I want to know what my talking points are. And that's a totally different setup. So I think it's always good to prepare in advance, but don't force yourself to stick to it too much because you might sound a bit mechanical or robotic. And even if you listen to radio ads or radio announcers or podcasts, you'll hear everything's scripted or pre-recorded, but they, their intonation and their, their flow of their voice is very conversational or very, you know, it's designed to keep you listening. So you can learn a lot from just listening to other people's recordings. So how I record my workflow, and I'm looking at the time now, it's 20 past 11. So I just don't want everyone to feel like I'm zooming through all this stuff, but it is definitely stuff that you're going to want to go offline or not offline, but you're going to go off this session, go on your web browser and look up some of these things after the fact, and you're going to want to compare pros and cons and what does it look like? So it requires a bit of research. The ones that I use are Zencaster and Zoom, mainly because Zencaster is free for, I think, two guests. And they used to just be audio only, but they've recently introduced video. So you can do no video recording, but record audio only, but your guest and you can see each other, which I like to do. I don't record the video normally unless I have to use Zoom. Uh, but they also offer video and audio recording too. And then there's paid options. I use Zoom as a backup because sometimes my guests, their Chrome is maybe out of date or their computer, they just can't load Zencaster. It's a web browser link and maybe something's not working. I use Zoom, but I don't always like to because there is sometimes a tinny sound or a delay. Uh, the audio can drop and I always record my own audio in Audacity as backup. So you can have Audacity running the entire time on record so that you have a local file as well. Audio Technica, I already showed you my, my mic and my, uh, my headphones, but check your input. Make sure whenever you are going in Audacity or you're in Zoom or you're in whatever platform you're using, make sure your microphone input is not still set to, so if you have earbuds like these, um, you know, or set to computer audio, you want it set to, it should say your microphone name. So mine pops up as blue snowball. And you want to make sure that you log in and check that it's recognizing that before. I've found some platforms like Audacity. If I already have Audacity open and then I plug in my microphone, it still doesn't recognize the microphone. I have to force quit it and restart it and then it'll recognize it. So just little things like that because it makes a huge difference to the sound quality. And I've recorded intros before where I didn't realize it was picking up my computer audio, my computer microphone, which is hidden at the back of my Mac. So it just sounded really bad and I didn't know what it was. So just make sure you check your inputs, get another USB port. If you want, I bought a pretty cheap, USB port that I could plug five different USBs into because all these things 
need ports to go into. And a lot of the Apple products or um, whichever device you're using only have limited USB ports. I use Wi-Fi. I make sure all my programs are closed. So there's nothing running in the background that's gonna pop up and crash. So right now I closed everything except for Zoom and my, my slides because I don't want anything draining my computer's energy. Same with when you're podcasting. For yourself, drink lots of water, try to relax. Um, you know, this chair, I'm realizing the more I use this office, it makes noises when I move and it's kind of creaky. So I might get another chair at, at some point because I don't want to have to edit that out. Um, log on 10 minutes early or a few minutes earlier, just check all those things so that you can go in a bit more relaxed. And I like to save, uh, so my Zencaster backs up to Dropbox, but I also save files on my desktop. And then I might also save them on Google Drive because I'm paranoid that they, will be wiped. Or if you have an external hard drive, you could do that. So this is a behind the scenes of what Zencaster looks like. And you can see me there, my name and my guest would pop up below that and they could raise their hand and there's a chat window and you can do video and mic and the stop pause button is where you would see record. And if you keep stopping throughout or you jump in and out of the call, it'll make multiple new recordings. One thing I found with Zencaster though, is if you or your guests log off and close their browser straight away, it might not back up. So I always ask them to leave the browser open for a few minutes. And I have even had to ask a guest to send me their local audio files because what Zencaster does is it saves theirs on their local disk and it's only theirs though. So it'll be two split files that you need to thread together. And I've had files where it's just me with pauses, talking, waiting for the answers and the other person has disappeared. So that could happen. So just prepare for that and let them know. And everyone that I've interviewed has been very helpful and humble and nobody has said, don't you know what you're doing? Why, why did this happen? And you know, nothing bad has happened. So just try as you learn these, you know, as you fail or have these mistakes, you'll learn, okay, maybe I won't do that this time or maybe I'll let them know or give them a heads up. So I always have a, a Zoom backup link ready to go to send them. And I've learned to not send it in the booking email or the calendar invite because people will get confused which one they're meant to be using, but just have a backup plan or another date to reschedule. So this is a part that you can just tune me out if you don't want to edit your own podcast and if you want to just outsource it because, uh, but this is also the part where I want to scare you into the amount of work it is to produce your own podcast. So the part many people outsource and they are probably going to sound um, very professional and they will have their own uh, music probably, and they might have different sound effects or different ads. So just keep that in mind. If you're listening to other people's podcasts and they have all these different things going on and you're like, I don't know how I would even add that you can outsource it. It's okay. So some things to think about. Okay, three to five minutes editing per one minute audio. I found mine was sometimes around five, but that's a good equation to use. So if I'm interviewing people for 30 minutes, I times that by five and know that's how long it's gonna take me to edit it. Or plus I record an intro and an outro. So the thing that I like to do in advance, um, the question about the scripting in advance, I do send the questions. I do draft their bio for them because I don't wanna be doing back and forth on, can you confirm this is your bio? I sometimes read it out at the beginning of the interview. And then I know when I go to do the show notes and I go to do my intro, their bio's already been written and I just have to read it out. So I try to do all that in advance. Um, files might need a lot of cleanup with your audio. It is, I've already mentioned it can be draining, uh, but there are lots of free tutorials online via Google or via you know, YouTube, Audacity. And worst case scenario, you can find podcast uh, producers or editors or studios that can help you with this. So this is the technical, how I do what I do. I don't know if you want me to read through all this because um, we're getting close with time, but I use Buzzsprout. Most important thing is I prepare in advance. I use Zencaster, Zoom as a backup. I edit in Audacity. I publish on Buzzsprout. You can create audio files on Buzzsprout 
and you can push through to the platforms on there. And it's about $12 US a month to host and they don't delete your files. So if you don't pay for the hosting, they'll, they'll delete your files after a few months or a few, you know, once you hit an episode threshold. Um, I record all of my own stuff in Audacity on my local software disk. And then I thread it all together. I export it as an MP3 to upload to Buzzsprout. I also export a wave and a project file if I need to go back and cut different sections. So I like to edit the three split episodes at a time so that I don't have to go back and forth and remember what I've done. And I, yeah, I, I usually try to also upload it to YouTube uh, for the trailer, like the preview clip, which is usually under 60 seconds as a video. So that's my production workflow. <laughs> um, I have linked to a tutorial from Buzzsprout, which is very good. And these are the key commands or things that I do. So when you go to your dropdown in Audacity, and Carrie will share this, these um, slides hopefully with you afterwards and the recording of this, but these are the key tools that I use in Audacity. And I always duplicate the original. I never wanna overwrite the original just in case something goes wrong. So the most important part is the one at the bottom where uh, I find if I prepare and I write my script in advance and it's usually on text edit or an email, it's very simple. But if I've prepared in advance, then the editing is a lot easier. Just like anything, right, they say. So this is the visual of what Audacity looks like and how it's exporting. And those are some of my show notes. Character count is limited. So I like to just do bullet points and an overview of the bio and I link to their uh, promotion links. So their social media and their website. So the last section is promo and Carrie, I don't know if you want me to keep going, I will keep going. Um, if everyone's go ahead, go ahead. And if anyone needs to drop off, they can drop off, but yeah, let's go ahead and finish it up. Okay. So someone just asked you, is Zencaster free at the moment? It is, uh, for the basic plan. So promoting your podcast, this is just artwork I've designed. So I have used Canva for my artwork. <coughs> Excuse me, which is also free, but you can use paid plans as well. Um, things to think about with your promotions are the schedule of when are you going to promote it? Are you going to promote each episode multiple times? Are you going to split some of your quotes into graphics? Are you going to, you know, link to every podcast platform available, or do you really only care about being listed on iTunes? Um, the guest bio website and social links, these could change depending on your guest's work. So just make sure that you have the most up-to-date bio and the preferred social links. And I always ask that question at the end to how they can get in touch with them because I wanna make sure I have their preferred tool. Uh, think of your, co your cross promotion. So that's more your content marketing strategy that I mentioned in the first half of this session and how you can repurpose your content and then link to your clients, um, yours or your client's business. So this I'd put in, in case you were um, offering podcasting for somebody else. So if you are highlighting a guest in your interview, you can link to their business, but also link to your own business as well in the show notes. Make sure you put something because you've done all that hard work of interviewing and scheduling and, and editing. Uh, this is my workflow. I publish Tuesdays and Fridays. The reason I do that is because I usually send a bi-weekly newsletter on a Friday to my Mixing Babies and Business audience. So I just wanted to be able to link to the episode there. I wanted to have some momentum. I wanted the episodes to not be spaced too far apart that people would just lose interest if I'm splitting the interview. Uh, I use Buzzsprout to schedule episodes. So it's kind of like a blog post scheduler where you can select the day and the time and it'll go out. I have seen some people's though, I don't know if they were using Buzzsprout, but some platforms, there could be tech glitches and it might go out on the wrong day if you do that. So just be aware if you have like 50 episodes pre-scheduled that that could happen. Um, I create social graphics in Canva that are designed to be optimized for social media, but I also create uh, the MP4 clips. So in Buzzsprout, there's an actual export option where you can select a period of your episode. So anywhere from 
you know, 30 to 60 seconds. I use Instagram TV to upload and promote them. So IGTV requires 60 seconds minimum. So I select 60 seconds of a clip of a testimonial. And then I design specific artwork for that because the IGTV covers are different. Um, I add all of this stuff to a Dropbox folder for each guest. I create a Google sheet or a Google doc, I should say. I link to everything that I've promoted. I link to every episode. I write their show notes out and I make it really easy for them. I do a sample social media post for them as well if they want to share the episode. Um, and I thought that that would be standard, but I've had feedback that it's not. So people are like, oh, wow, I really appreciate this. Or um, someone who does podcasting as a business has said, oh, I know this is a lot of the work that goes into this, but I really appreciate it. And then they share it more. So really, I was just doing it because I thought that that was like the end to end of the interview. Uh, but you don't have to do all that if you don't want to. But if you want your guests, you know, if they have a bigger audience than you or reach a different audience than than you currently do, you should make it as easy for them to share as possible. And then I also, I'm really bad with this. I've really got to fix my SEO and my website and YouTube stuff because that fell off in terms of my consistency and my promotion workflow. So I'm really good till I get the episodes out, I promote. And then now the final step is using, repurposing that content. But the great thing about podcasts are as long as you pay for your platform, it'll be up there and people can still keep finding it. So you don't have to do everything at once if you want to space it out. And right now, because I was unwell over the summer, what I did was I am highlighting each interview bi-weekly and I link to the three episodes and I summarize what each guest talked about across their three episodes. And because now I have a bit of a bank of content, I didn't have to come up with a lot of newsletter content over the summer because I could just say, oh, did you miss this? this chat I had with this person. So you can keep doing that and keep sharing those, you know, quote graphics. These are some screenshots of what my content workflow, like my promotion workflow looks like. So on the left, you'll see that's what Buzzsprout displays as if you went to the, I have a Buzzsprout link specifically where you can see um, all the episodes and it also connects to all the platforms. The email, is a screenshot of what I send to the guests. So I let them know this is our interview. This is what I've included. There's a LinkedIn screenshot, a YouTube channel, the IGTV graphic, how it displays. And I like that it shows the little, so people know that it's a sound file. And, uh, and I also, Buzzsprout, the other thing I like that they do is they award your achievements not with money or anything, but they make a little graphic or they send you an email and they go, yay, you did your first 10 episodes. Yay, you did your first 25, 50, whichever. And so I have created graphics around that too, to show who my guests were for those interviews. So some additional tips for you on promotion. I have linked to another article from Buzzsprout, which is a blog post on marketing. And so really it's consistency, showing up for yourself, asking for help if you need to outsource things and being accountable. So if you say that you're gonna do something and you book a guest in, uh, then respect their time, respect your audience's time and attention, use your content, repurpose it as much as you can. And if you want to explore a sponsorship or crowdfunding um, or collaboration opportunities, that's another way you can monetize your podcast which I didn't intend to do initially, um, but then I was asked to be a Startup Canada community and they have asked to sponsor my podcast. So I didn't go out pitching the podcast to other people, but you might, depending on what you're talking about in your audience, you might draw interest and people might want to be seen to be supporting what you're doing. So just think of that. Um, and if you wanna be completely user supported, then that's another option too. People use uh, Ko-fi or Coffee, uh, PayPal, um, Patreon, all these different platforms to enable that. So another thing I like, another quote that I like to remember is how you do one thing is how you do everything. So even though I started off doing the events and the guest speaking, it's evolved to, I've been asked to be on someone else's podcast and I didn't pitch to them, they pitched to me, but it was very specific to 
what I talk about, mixing babies in business. Um, these are some screenshots of me interviewing guests and Kevin had shared that on his content. So like, you just don't know how other people will receive your content, but just how you show up for yourself and for your audience is important. So try to be consistent. Uh, so session recap that I just like to go over is the important things are what do you want to achieve from podcasting either as a guest or as hosting your own? How much time do you actually have to commit? Think about those pros and cons that I listed in detail. Uh, think about the four jobs you could be potentially creating for yourself or the fun, the four fun experiences that you could be creating for yourself if you want to think of it that way. Uh, learn as you go, have fun, and most importantly, just hit publish, get it out there. Don't become your own worst critic. It can be as hard or as easy as you make it. Um, I did outline a lot of these things in a blog post I wrote in the spring. And I wrote a step-by-step -step of how I do all this stuff. So that is also linked there if you want to look at that in more detail. Other resources for you, like you have the podcast link if you want to listen to that and how I've produced mine. These are some other podcasts that I like to listen to that are specific to entrepreneurship and women in business specifically. So I, they're not all hyperlinked, but you can search them on a lot of the screenshots are from Spotify, which is free to download as an app on your phone. You'll just have ads, but they're all listed there if you want to have a look for them and get some inspiration. And I'd love to know if you have time and if you want to share it in the chat, if you have any key takeaways that you've gotten from this session or, you know, things that surprised you, uh, ideas for interviews that you're going to do now or that you're going to pitch for uh, or new skills that maybe you didn't realize that you could learn in the coming year that you are excited to learn. And I lastly have uh, my contact details. So if you want to connect to me, I'm pretty active. Uh, more so on LinkedIn these days than the other channels, but I will respond to you if you <laughs> message me on those ones too. It just might take a bit longer. I also have a personal website and I have linked to ways that you can work with me if you want before I have this baby to help you with your podcast. <laughs> so I'm due in January and I'm trying to you know, share as much information with people as I can before that happens, because I probably will be offline or, you know, not speaking about these topics as much for the first half of 2022. So if you want to launch your podcast in the next few months or year, then please get in touch. And, uh, and if you want to download any resources that I've mentioned for mixing babies and business, those are all on the, um, mixing babies and business.com website. And that is the the platform link where everything's easy to download if you want to access oh, that. Awesome, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm aware of the time. So if you have questions, comments, I'm going to invite you actually to reach out to Amy directly through that contact slide. I know she'd be, she would just love to absolutely connect with you for today. I realize we've just gone a bit over time. So I want to respect your time for sure today. And thank you for those of you who stuck right with us to the very end. It's absolutely incredible. So uh, our thanks to you, Amy, for sharing your insights. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I know that the Zoom chat has been full of uh, appreciation for this website or for this workshop today. So thank you, Amy, on behalf of all of us. Thank you.